Henry VII is somewhat of a fan favourite on the history with Hilbert, what they might call a friend of the show on the rest is history. And this is because several of my earliest videos were actually about Henry VII and the Tudors at large, mostly thanks to at the time that I was studying for my A-level exams in history, big shout out to Mr. Grey, and that's why I made these videos to help myself and my classmates revise. Now this is a long time ago, but I still find the Tudors and particularly Henry VII, the larger wars of the Roses, a fascinating period of history. So there are several other videos to look at, but in today's video I wanted to look at a particular aspect of Henry VII, because of course he is famous in English history for the Battle of Bosworth, fought in 1485 between his own forces and those of the reigning king, King Richard III, who of course would go on to lose the battle in dramatic fashion and Henry would be crowned king ending the Wars of the Roses and bringing to the fore the Tudor dynasty. However, the word Tudor, whilst it has now become a seemingly very English name with this dynasty of English kings being named after it, is not in fact English at all. And actually, the Tudor, or should I say Tudor, is actually a Welsh family from Wales, and Henry has his roots in the country of Wales, where he isn't known as Henry Tudor at all, but as Harry Tudor. And so given his Welsh connections, I want to ask, did Henry VII know how to speak Welsh? Well, that's what the topic of today's video is, and so we should look back at not only Henry himself, but also the larger Tudor family. We know, for instance, that his grandfather, Owen Tudor, also had a very Welsh variant of his name, which was Owen ap Meredydd ap Tudor. And in Welsh, the ap in this time period signified that it was the son of someone of that name. And indeed, this Owen was the son of someone called Meredydd ap Tudor, who was himself a Welshman at the time of the Owen Glyndwr rebellion against the English, when Owen Glyndwr was uh, pronounced as the last prince of Wales. And so they rose up in rebellion against the English, including Henry's own ancestor, Meredydd. And so it's very clear that at that point, Meredith himself was a Welsh-speaking noble who fought together with other Welsh-speaking noblemen against the English. It is, however, Owen who is the most important of Henry's ancestors, because Owen had a dalliance with Catherine de Valois, who was the widow of Henry V, who of course was the English hero at Agincourt, and so it's through him that Henry created extra legitimacy to be able to rule the English and take over the English throne. We know that their love child was Edmund Tudor, who would go on to become uh, the father of Henry, although he would die before Henry was born. Now, Edmund Tudor spent a large part of his life in England, in Richmond, and so we're not actually sure if his father spoke Welsh, but that's also slightly by the by, because the young Henry would actually never meet his father, because his father died three months before Henry was born in captivity. Now, Henry was born in 1457 in Pembroke, County castle, which is in the south of Wales. So great, that probably means he learned Welsh by going outside and hearing people speaking Welsh. Well, at this point in time, and still for a large part today, the very south of Wales wasn't very Welsh speaking at all as a result of the English and the Norman conquests in Wales. And so this part of Wales was actually known as Little England Beyond Wales. Now writing in 1603, so at the very end of Henry's granddaughter's reign, Elizabeth I, the historian George Owen describes the area and the linguistic uh, situation that was in this south, south of Wales. And he says, yet do these two nations keep each other from dealing with the other as mere strangers so that the meaner sort of people will not or do not usually join together in marriage although they be in 100 and sometimes in the same parish nor commerce nor buy but in open fairs so that you shall find in one parish a pathway parting the Welsh and the English and the one side speaking all English the other all Welsh and differing in tilling and in measuring of their land and divers other matters. Now, there is also specific note about the linguistic situation. 
They keep their language among themselves without receiving the Welsh speech or learning any part thereof, and hold themselves so close to the same that to this day they wonder at a Welshman coming among them, the one neighbour saying to the other, look, there goeth a Welshman. Based on this, it doesn't seem too likely that Henry would have picked up Welsh living in the surroundings of Pembroke Castle as the surrounding area was largely English speaking and of course he was one of the higher nobility. However, in 1461, following the defeat of his protector Jasper Tudor, his uncle, he would go into the care of William Herbert, who was a Yorkist, whereas Henry's family were Lancastrians, supporting the ruling king rather than those rebelling against him in the Wars of the Roses. William Herbert is an interesting figure, and he had his home castle in Raglan Castle, which is where Henry spent several of the next years. This is rather important because we don't know for certain whether William Herbert was also a Welsh speaker. However, we do know that he employed several Welsh bards and poets to create praise poetry about him in the Welsh language. So it seems likely if that was happening that he indeed could understand Welsh, could speak Welsh and chose to have poems about him composed in this language. It's at this point that some of the more modern historians from the later 20th century, Ralph Griffiths and Roger Thomas, state that Henry had a Welsh-speaking nurse who raised him at Raglan Castle and taught him the Welsh language. This is asserted in their book from 1985, but it's rather hard to find any evidence for this actually having happened. And as the two names suggest, these are both Welsh authors and in various uh, Welsh circles, it has often been said that of course he spoke Welsh because it fits well with him being a Welsh king. However, it's rather hard to find the actual evidence for this of Henry himself having spoken Welsh and indeed of him ever having learnt Welsh from a Welsh nurse, although the possibility, of course, is there. He certainly would have heard Welsh at Raglan Castle, but whether he himself learnt the language is a different point. Henry was in Raglan Castle until 1469, at which point he moved around quite a lot with his uncle Jasper Tudor, going to London, then going to Brittany, which at that point was still independent from France, and then going on to France too. Now, is it possible that his uncle Jasper could have taught him Welsh at this point or continued to speak Welsh with him? Yes. Do we have any evidence for it? No, not at all. Of course, he was in France, so he would have been speaking French, which was quite normal for the aristocracy at the time to know French. But of course, in 1485, with help from the French king and uh, with various mercenaries, many of whom were also Welsh, he would make his bid for the throne. And it is rather telling that the place where he decided to land was in South Wales, not very far from where he was from. This was partially because of his ancestry and because large parts of South Wales were rather loyal to the Lancastrian cause, which of course was the cause that he was fighting for. And indeed, over the marches that he would undertake through Wales, he would get support from the Welsh. Um, we don't, again, get any evidence of the language that he is speaking while he is on this campaign, unfortunately, but it does say something that many of his allies would have definitely been Welsh speaking at that point, although that need not necessarily mean that he too was Welsh. So we also have the inferences from the fact that although we don't know if he was speaking Welsh, we know that Welsh speakers, particularly Welsh bards, Welsh poets, were writing about Henry himself. So Daffydd Ddu and uh, another Griffith Ap Daffydd were both very important poets at the time who referred to Henry as the youth of Brittany defeating the Saxons, calling upon a lot of Arthurian tales as well as uh, between the lines that of Owen Glyndwr, who had fought against the English as a hero for the Welsh. And with this kind of imagery, they tried to get the Welsh to support Henry against Richard as a Welsh champion fighting against an English king. These poets, and indeed Henry himself, would actively play up his Welsh ancestry in a bid to get support, playing on such Arthurian legends as well. And of course, later on, after Henry had gone on to win the Battle of Bosworth, his firstborn son wouldn't be named Edward or Henry or John, as many English kings, but Arthur. Arthur, 
Now, of course, this Arthur would die young and his second son, who was called Henry, would come to the throne and become Henry VIII. But this does say something about the uh, direction of, of his loyalties and indeed his ancestry. Although, again, it doesn't tell us whether he himself could speak Welsh. We also know that at the Battle of Bosworth, a large part of his force did indeed consist of Welshmen, who were richly rewarded after the Battle of Bosworth. And something that is said, but that will be for another video to make, is that Henry was ashamed of his Welsh heritage and didn't play it up at all, but I think actually that is a rather overblown argument, especially if you look at his standard during the battle, which of course featured the green and white colours and the Welsh dragon, Idrai Goth, and also the fact that after the battle his coat of arms was made up a combination of his mother's uh, coat of arms, the, the Beaufort symbol of the Greyhound, and the red dragon of uh, Cathwaladr, or uh, the red dragon of Wales once again. But he, he only he went to um, prison for a year, I think, and then he let yeah. him out and made him the warden of the north again. So yeah. Henry Tudor sort of um, thanked him for it. I should believe the Padik Shoch and they're there all. James. Field. Field in England. Not just any field. No. Um, Enlighten me. Bosworth Field. Bosworth Field. Da -da -da -da. Near it, at least. Yes. We're quite close. There's quite a lot of fields around here, so I suppose there's more than one Bosworth Field. You should go to Bosworth Field. Here we go, on the way to Bosworth Field in 1485, two armies were descending upon these fields north of, well, west of Leicester, ready for a great showdown that is sometimes considered to be the end of the Middle Ages in England. What a climax, what a battle, the end of the Wars of the Roses, at least the fun part, the end of the Plantagenets, the start of the Tudors, and the line that continues to this day, cracking stuff. There we have the two banners, one of Richard, the white boar, of course the white rose of York, and behind Idrai Goch the red dragon, the Welsh dragon, that of course Henry, having been born in Wales, he was a Welshman, Tudor being a Welsh family, going back to Owen Tudor, who got laid with an English queen, which gave him his right to rule. Here we go. Bad luck. The Song of Roland. What have you found, James? It worked! Is it gone? Yeah. Yeah. No. Okay. It's changed quite a bit, hasn't it?
trog hier naar praten. <laughs> Trom je veel op. Nee. Then I'll bloody have you, I will. I come from Wales and I will take you down. Right? Everyone knows. I'm gonna need a fucking some other action. Oi, oi, oi. King Richard's Stone. Originally erected near Shenton in 1974, as this was thought to be the site of Sandford, where Richard III is said to have died during the Battle of Bosworth. But in 20, 2009, after several years of careful study and extensive fieldwork, the true site of the battle was discovered in the area around Mill Lane. Mill Lane? It was in Cambridge? Huh? That's a bit far. How'd he get there? He wonder he didn't have a horse. Anyway, the likely site of Sandford close to a proven medieval marsh and the fine spot of the Bosworth Boar Badge is on private land, 2.5 kilometres to the southwest of Ambien Hill, which is where the visitor centre is. And that's why the visitor centre isn't on the actual battle site, because it is now private land and it was thought that the battle site was closer to here, whereas it actually was not, as it transpired. Isn't that right, James? Yes. And what do we have here? A bath. A bathtub. Yeah. Richard's bathtub. Richard of York's bathtub. Right then. But it says there it's the Earl Shilton coffin. They've got it completely wrong. Is that Ricardians, fake news? No. Ricardian. Oh, Ricardian slander. Is that what it is? Yeah. For the rightful it's king. Shakespeare propaganda. Shakespearean propaganda. Well. Bosworth also lived on in the Welsh bardic imagination, with several poems being written about the events at Bosworth, again painting Henry in this light as a saviour of the Welsh, or more broadly the Celtic peoples against the, the Saxons or the English, which obviously is a little skewed because he went on to become king of the English and was also part English himself. And actually my uh, recital skills of poems in Welsh aren't too good, but luckily one of my friends and former colleagues is excellent at this and they are going to read some of these poems for us here about the Battle of Bosworth in Welsh. Brywydr a fi, beredir fodd, brain irian a i bryn yr oedd, cynchwerodd y King Harry, y maes drwy nerth ein maester ni, lladd angel, llawdd i angen, lladd y baedd aelli oedd a i bryn, a syr is mal syr ei sawr, a'r gwaiw na'i mysg, a'r gynnyw mawr. As ever, I love in my videos to get some of the flavour of the languages of the past. If you'd be interested to hear more from Angharad, who has just read this text about the Battle of Bosworth, then do please check out the links in the description to their pages where you can find out more from them on their... Uh, Spotify and their other links as well, of course, in Welsh, which is really, really cool. Something that may be instructive is that in 1486 in Worcester, when Henry was received by a Welsh bard, the Welsh bard did play up his Welsh ancestry and connections. But note the language in which the poem was composed. It's in English, it's not in Welsh. So perhaps that means that Henry couldn't understand Welsh, and that's why the poem was in English, whereas normally the bard would compose in Welsh. It says, Cadvalada's blood linearly descending, long hath be told of such a prince coming. Wherefore, friends, if that I shall not lie, this same is the fulfiller of the prophesy. Which is good stuff, but it's in English. Anyway, that's the end. Oh, it's not the end, because actually in 1503, when his wife, Elizabeth of York, died, it said that the only thing that could calm Henry was the sound of the Welsh harp and we know that he personally paid for the funeral of one of his Welsh harpists and so we may question well the Welsh bards would sing in Welsh most of all so does that mean that he'd be able to understand well if that poem is anything to go by perhaps they'd be singing in English or even if he couldn't understand Welsh perhaps he would still listen to the Welsh songs we just don't know but this is an interesting question to ask if there's anything that I have missed in the question of whether Henry the seventh could speak Welsh if you have other evidence that you would like to share about Henry VII and the languages that he knew, then I am all ears. I would love to hear it, but this is just the research that I've been able to do about whether Henry VII would be able to speak or understand Welsh at all or not. 
Thank you very much for watching this video. I realize that it is coming out a day too late, uh, but that is just because life is very busy at the minute. I've moved to the Netherlands. I am um, doing internship at the Friesk Academie. Uh, all many, many good things, but it's been incredibly busy. I'll have some more Frisian themed videos up very soon because I've been having an amazing time uh, going to Friesland and uh, spending time there working on my Frisian uh, and learning lots more. So lots more to come in the future. Huge, huge thank you to Angharad uh, for their help with this video. This was really, really awesome that they were able to provide uh, the poetry in the beautiful language of Welsh that Henry VII made or may not have been able to understand. But until the next time, I have been Hilbert and this has been The History. Diochen Lauer. <laughs>